What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. It is my pleasure today to be joined by Jacob Scappis from JPS. Jacob, how you doing, my man? I'm well, thanks, Mike. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. We have a scorching hot topic of discussion today for the listeners, and that is the quote-unquote current volume debate. So I think I think most of the listeners will be familiar with this topic. We had the initial paper, the letter to the editor, authored by Dr. Mike Isatel, Jared Feather. I think Dr. Carl Janot was on that paper as well, um, talking about the traditional RP training model, increasing sets over the mesocycle. And then we had the reply to the letter to the editor, which was authored by Dr. Eric Helms, Brian Miner, and Jacob Skeffis. And I'm sure the listeners have listened to the other debates on similar podcasts about this topic. Recently, Jacob and one of his colleagues put up a video on the JPS YouTube with some some very practical takeaways for the listeners because as we discussed before the podcast, you know, as the result of it being a debate, the the practical takeaways the application can get lost and while all the individuals are intellectual they they provide excellent information to to us consumers when there is a debate there is sort of you know winners and losers to a degree there becomes interest in defending certain methodologies especially since we have two different papers that are you know more or less in conflict to one another so i wanted to get jacob on to expand upon his video and just provide more practical application to the listeners to those who are passionate and interested in this field and, and want to learn more about how to apply these principles and, and design their training programs so with with that introduction out of the way, I will put the ball in your court, Jacob. You can you can take this one wherever you want to go, and then we'll dive into to the details. So considering the main point in the paper that was a reply to the letter to the editor, we probably shouldn't increase sets from week to week, at least not every week dogmatically. So if we shouldn't increase sets from week to week, when should we increase sets? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, not an easy one to answer, uh, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so I guess the best place to start with this discussion is what is the role of sets uh, in the context of a training program? Uh, well, the number of sets we perform uh, is one way of defining uh, training volume. And that's simply the dose of the stimulus and uh, how much you expose the system uh, to a specific stressor and it's going to depend on goal and context obviously but i'm assuming we're talking about hypertrophy as that was the uh, topic for the letter to the editor and our response paper uh, so for hypertrophy uh, we measure sets uh, by the number of hard sets so we have an intensity threshold in there so sets taken above an rp of six below an rir so reps in reserve of four and in my opinion, uh, set increases should occur on an as-needs basis. And we know that there's an inverted U nonlinear dose response relationship uh, between set volume and hypertrophy. So basically, the more hard sets you do, the more growth you get up until a point where you start to see a plateau and then regression. Uh, and the terminology that Mike has uh, used to describe uh, the different responses at differing uh, points on that curve, uh, minimum effective volume. So when we do um, the amount of volume to get us just small gains, and then we have the maximum adaptive volume, uh, which is where we get the best gains. And then Mike has the maximum recovery volume uh, where we're overreaching and we're no longer seeing um, you know, gains in size and or strength. Uh, so, Volume, as I said, is the dose of the stimulus. And for hypertrophy, we want to get the right stimulus uh, so that we get growth. Uh, and that stimulus is uh, high degrees of mechanical tension. And we get a lot of mechanical tension uh, with high intensity of effort. So training uh, within close proximity to failure, as I said, that was that intensity threshold. Uh, and also lifting heavy, so uh, you know, lifting above 60% of our one rep max, and you know, the mechanical tension we get is going to increase from there. So, the role that volume plays is that it doses that tension, and 
Uh, set increases should primarily occur when the current dose of the stimulus is not eliciting positive adaptations anymore, or at least the magnitude of adaptations that you desire. And I would caveat that with the uh, fact that set volume increases uh, should only be done when all other variables have been ruled out as being a potential reason for that plateau or stall. Uh, and other variables could include, you know, peak intensity uh, is, is not sufficient, uh, technique, recovery, like sleep, lifestyle, all these kind of factors, right? Uh, and there's some obvious times to increase the number of sets that you perform. Uh, and this will be after an intro week. So we're using, say, lower volumes uh, just to acclimate to the, to the training plan uh, or after you deload or when moving from a strength and peaking block um, to a hypertrophy program. That would be the obvious ones, right? Um, outside of that, when should you add sets? Uh, my recommendation is, as I said, to do it on an as-needs basis. And that's not very useful um, because we need to know what our needs are and how to assess that. Uh, so I do recommend looking at objective and subjective recovery. So objective recovery being our performance um, and whether or not you know, you're having a lot of soreness and all these kind of things, as well as subjective recovery. So um, just how you're feeling day to day, uh, as well as your performance. So repetition strength across multiple sets. And if time allows, uh, before the end of a mesocycle on single joint exercise or movements that aren't very fatiguing, I think you can add sets uh, as well. So there's really three things that I'm looking at um, to determine whether or not we increase sets. Recovery being the first one, performance the second, and time uh, as well. So not only time constraints uh, of a given workout that a lifter might have, uh, but the time point of a mesocycle. So how close are we to deloading? Because if you're at the start of a mesocycle, or even midway through uh, adding sets and jacking up the dose of the press, uh, could be problematic because you couldn't run into recovery issues. Whereas if you're adding sets at the end of a mesocycle, especially on movements that aren't um, you know, highly fatiguing and don't cause a lot of central fatigue or have you know, high degrees of axial loading, so through load through the spine that can you know, cause longer recovery than uh, other movements that have less axial loading, uh, I think adding sets is totally fine. I hope I answered that question for you there, Mike. Excellent. Uh, I think you did a terrific job of answering that question. Um, I, I, the main point we're getting at here is that sets should probably be increased on an as-needed basis. A, as you outlined, maybe we increase sets after a, an intro week. It, it makes sense there. Maybe we're increasing sets towards the end of a mesocycle, particularly on some of those isolation movements that are systemically low-fatiguing exercises. Um, and then, you know, to bust through a plateau. If, if recovery is in check, progress is stalled, then maybe it's a good time to increase sets. And those are absolutely all uh, valid strategies to uh, increase sets. Uh, a more specific question for you here, it could be considered uh, an as needed to increase sets, maybe not. But if we look at some accessory or isolation movements, ones where it's particularly difficult to increase load from, from session to session, even mesocycle to mesocycle, maybe something like a dumbbell curl or, or a cable lateral rate. Does it ever make more sense to add on a set to an exercise before increasing reps or load? Yes, I think if we come back to uh, some of those initial points I was making about the role of uh, set volume in hypertrophy, um, we're simply exposing the muscle to more of that mechanical tension by performing more sets. Now, as you mentioned, uh, some accessory and isolation movements can be very difficult to progress in, in the short term, right? So uh, exercises such as your lateral raise, uh, your dumbbell curl, especially when you're using uh, free weights or a uh, machine or anything that has a fixed load increment uh, that is a large relative increase from one load to the next. So you don't have that ability to micro load, right? So take, for example, you're doing lateral raises and most gyms, they'll have dumbbells. You know, we use kilos here. I'm pretty sure that you use pounds over there. Um, so we'll have dumbbells one, two, three, four, all the way through to 10 kilos. And then from 10 kilos, the next jump is up to 12 kilos. So that's a that's a 20 percent increase. That's a large increase. So for a small muscle like the side delt, uh, it, it's very difficult to progress in load uh, 
um, because of those fixed load increments and the large relative increase of those loads. Uh, similarly, performing another rep, if you're going from, say, 9 to 10 reps, that's quite a lot. If you're going from 20 to 21 reps, that's not as much. So the relative increase um, of not only the reps, so based on the rep range that you're performing, but also the load increments available to you, um, can mean that it's really difficult to progress um, your training for those kind of exercises, right? So adding sets, what that can do is increase the exposure to that mechanical tension uh, without having to necessarily add weight or add reps, right? So we're just getting more of that stress, more of that stimulus. Now that can be beneficial if, as I mentioned earlier, we're somewhere in that you know, minimum effective dose to maximal adaptive dose range. If by adding a set, we start to push ourselves beyond, uh, you know, what we can adapt to, that's problematic. So I definitely see a case for the exercises, uh, sorry, isolation exercises and smaller muscle groups um, for adding sets uh, because it can get us more of that stimulus and that could be what we need to get more growth. We know that when we get more growth, a bigger muscle fiber relative to its size can produce more force and therefore will be able to either lift more weight for the same reps and the same RPE, lift the same weight for more reps and the same RPE, or lift the same weight for the same reps at a lower RPE, right? So that's what building muscle is all about, right? Training, we should be training better as we get better. Now, I think in cases where we, you know, are stuck in a rep range, um, we can't really progress reps and load increments are fixed and that's really difficult to progress as well. And we know that we're recovering okay and um, you know, performance is flatlining a little bit. I think injecting uh, sets for those kind of exercises is absolutely fine. Uh, so yeah, just to sort of recap uh, you know, what I outlined there, uh, I think we need to remember that every form of progression yields different but not entirely distinct adaptations. Uh, and progression in any variable should consider both the absolute and relative change in whichever variable is being increased over that time scale and the overload potential of the system. So whether or not you can actually do more and see positive adaptations. Uh, so yeah, uh, in cases where the muscle groups are more forgiving recovery wise, uh, such as the side delts, even you know the biceps, things like this. Uh, and when the overload potential uh, for the reps and loads uh, is, is relatively small, uh, adding sets is totally a viable means of increasing uh, that exposure to mechanical tension. Great context there, Jacob. Um, as we're dabbling in some more specific questions for how we progress through the mesocycle, um, you know, I do think you are the perfect candidate for this discussion because you very openly said, yeah, I, I use all of these approaches and I, and I mix and match depending on the individual and, and the situation. Within the way that you structure training programs, if we consider longer term periodization models, do you ever find yourself altering sets between mesocycles or are you just really saving that for if progress is stalled and then we're manipulating yeah no i definitely do in terms of uh, periodization i think it's really useful for listeners to understand what that fancy buzzword that sounds really complicated like you have to read you know all these textbooks written by the soviets in the 80s to understand <laughs> uh, Periodization is basically planning and organizing, right? It's being deliberate about your training and manipulating things um, in a manner that is conducive to whatever outcome you want um, and paying attention to, you know, specificity, variation, you know, fatigue management, overload, all those kind of things, right? Um, so over the long term, uh, yeah, definitely looking to, to change sets um, on longer timescales. Um, and this is especially true when I have um, more intermediate and advanced lifters. So if they're starting to plateau uh, in a certain muscle group that we need to bring up, um, because of the fact that they're close to their genetic potential, they're not going to be able to achieve whole body hypertrophy in the same program, or at least not at a rate that is meaningful enough to be able to measure and determine whether or not what you're doing is working. So this is when I'll start to use uh, specialization phases, which is basically just prioritizing a certain muscle group. And my first point of call when I start to uh, program specialization phases is to de-emphasize other muscle groups. And what that means is I reduce the set volume for those other muscle groups, so we're not prioritizing, to free up adaptive resources uh, to go towards those priority muscle groups. Because, for example, let's say that 
and we see this all the time, actually. We see this all the time in powerlifters. When they, uh, you know, injure their back and they stop squatting and deadlifting, right? They don't necessarily change anything with their bench in, in most cases anyway. But what happens to their bench press? Their bench press strength just flies through the roof, right? And they go, wow, I just did all these PRs. Or if, you know, lifters do a bench-only competition, it's like their bench is, you know, 5 10% better than what it is when they do, you know, the full three lifts. And this is because they're simply recovering better. And from the same stimulus, they can get more out of it. So over longer time frames, uh, when I do have lifters getting into specialization cycles, they'll often see their volume for non-priority muscle groups in these phases go down to maintenance requirements. So they're just maintaining uh, their current level of muscle mass for that body part. And that frees up those resources to go towards whatever muscle group we want to prioritize. And then over time, because they do have more resources for recovery, we often see the volume for that muscle group go up. So in terms of periodization, um, you know, for these lifters who are specializing in body parts, uh, we see this ebb and flow of volume between maintenance for some muscle groups because we don't really need to grow those right now and we just want to free up some resources to growing those other muscle groups and then we swap it back, right? Um, so, yeah, we, we do see that, um, you know, volume is changing uh, from, you know, sometimes block to block. It's not usually meso to meso because a training block is generally three to four meso cycles uh, and a specialization phase is usually a block of training because it's no point specializing for, for five to eight weeks. Uh, you know, we know that muscle mass takes a long time to accrue. Uh, it's a very slow and uh, incremental adaptation. Uh, so generally longer time, you know, specializing is required. Uh, so yeah, I hope I answered the, the question there. Um, I'm sure we've got plenty more to unpack. For sure. Um, to summarize some of our key points here, so we're we're going to manipulate set volume to to overcome a performance plateau. We're also going to manipulate set volume to bring up weaker muscle groups. Sticking to this theme of periodization, do you ever find yourself using in your practice uh, an overall lower volume phase, perhaps with the intention of resensitizing the future high volume training, or even running a block where overall training volume is quite high, and maybe the rationale behind that is some sort of general work capacity phase for, for a specific individual who might need that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, look, I do use the lower volume phases. Um, they're more like a strength block, where, say, for example, uh, a lifter's performing 15 sets for the quads per week um, and their hypertrophy cycles, and then we go into this maintenance cycle or uh, strength cycle, we might reduce that down to eight or even, you know, six. And instead of looking to, you know, get more of that hypertrophy stimulus, I just want to see load go up at a uh, relatively uh, fixed and you know, easy RPE, say for example, someone's on the squat and I might just have them, you know, performing sets of five and an RPE seven and they've just got lower set volumes overall. So we're just looking to see performance go up. Uh, but I think in terms of the rationale behind that, resensitization is speculative at best. Uh, we don't know enough about it. So I'm not sure if it actually resensitizes, um, you know, lifter physiologically, right? to the point where they get accelerated growth when they return to um, more hypertrophy type training. Uh, but what I do think we get is uh, variation in the training objective. And I also think that variation uh, as shown by the literature is really, really important um, for preventing monotony and strain um, and decreasing the likelihood of burnout. So instead of having somebody, you know, always training close to failure always pushing high volumes and, you know, going into the gym every workout there, you know, for the most part, they're dreading because they know they've just got to push themselves. I think dialing back a little bit, bringing the RPE down, as I mentioned, letting them focus on load progression and dropping off some fatigue over a more, um, over a longer time period. So we know that fatigue is cumulative and hypertrophy training, we're accumulating a lot of fatigue all the time. Uh, I think just dropping that fatigue off over a mesocycle of lower volumes um, and looking to progress load, it not only gets rid of that accumulative fatigue, but it also just freshens, you know, the athlete up mentally because they're not just looking to train hard anymore and get close to failure and look for that uh, cadence slow down in their repetition, but also being able to, hey, let's see how strong I can get. I want to put some weight on the bar and see what I can lift. I think most lifters enjoy that. So uh, I'm not really too sure whether the resensitization uh, is actually uh, as – 
pronounced as what many people think. Uh, a lot of people do it uh, as if it's a, an absolute certainty that this is what happens. Um, but I think there are a number of other benefits that we have much more certainty uh, in than uh, the resensitization. And as I said, that would be the variation and the fatigue management. I, I couldn't agree more with, with the primary purpose behind those blocks. Uh, if I remember correctly, I th I think the author is like Okasarwa. I'm probably butchering that. It begins with an O yeah. or something like that. And there there's these studies where it's something similar to the tune of, you know, six weeks of training followed by like three weeks completely off or, or something like that followed by another six weeks. And seeing just how quickly the athlete can, can recover their strength and performance. And I think if anything, this is just like, really nice to know that you're not going to lose all your gains if you take mm -hmm. off but it doesn't seem like you know that you should be taking three weeks yeah. off every six weeks to potentiate your gains in the long term yeah no i totally agree i think there's a lot to be said for just dialing back um and having some lower stress periods right um we, we don't only need to look at you know stress and recovery on acute time scales uh, you know, when we're designing a program and the structure of a micro cycle, making sure that you know, an athlete can recover from workout to workout. But we also need to look at that over really long time scales because we know that connective tissue, um, you know, degrades over much slower rates and longer time courses. So uh, we need to take that into account as well as just the psychological demands of, you know, training hard, you know, week in, week out. And I think the um, maintenance phases where you're just, yeah, dialing back a little bit. And even just that word maintenance, people um, psychologically approach their training very differently because, oh, it's maintenance. You know, I'm not pushing for growth anymore, so I can chill out a little bit. And for most lifters, if they're well-trained, um, you don't get to being a well-trained, you know, bodybuilder or physique athlete um, unless you know how to hurt yourself in the gym. So I think um, periodically dialing things back to allow for uh, lower stress training over the course of weeks is super beneficial for longevity. Yeah, that's well said. And, and as you mentioned, you know, you, you can spin the these maintenance blocks a bit. If you are using a maintenance block as like a, a lower volume general strength phase, it's, you know, it's maintenance, but you spin it and say, well, this is the block where you get strong as hell. You know, that can be motivating yeah. to the individual while also relieving potential psychological stress from their usual training. Totally, man. Totally. I, I think that's, um, yeah, a really good way to, to spin it to athletes if they're not um, inclined or not buying into the idea of maintaining. They just want to keep pushing. It's like, well, no, we need to see how strong you are and like, let's, you know, push load because that's going to help us understand what kind of, you know, potential you have going into the next mesocycle. And all of a sudden, like, yeah, let's do it. Like, I'm keen to lift some big weights. Um, although then you've got to have a follow up conversation and say, okay, but we're pushing bigger weights, but we're not getting close to failure. I'm going to need to make sure that you're staying further away from failure because heavier loads, getting close to failure, that'll cause even more fatigue, and that can be a problem in and of itself. It, it, it's all fun and games until you have the, the yeah. bodybuilder who's like, so we're testing my 1RM at the end of the block, right? And you're like, yeah, you exactly. really don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Taking this too far. Um, Jacob, ki kind of transitioning here to something slightly different but sticking to this con contextual model of when it's appropriate to increase sets during the mesocycle does the training status of the athlete seem to matter at all to you so when you're looking at a new recruit and you assess whether they're a, a quote-unquote beginner intermediate or advanced all relative terms right but are you more likely to to increase sets for for one of these populations than the other yeah, so uh, I think this will sound really, really uh, simple when I say it, and, and that's, I, I think, a beautiful thing. Advanced trainees know how to hurt themselves, and they live with greater absolute loads and novice and intermediates. So adding sets for an advanced lifter is like dropping gallons of gasoline onto a bushfire. Shit's only going to get worse before it gets better, right? Um, so if you're adding sets in any kind of, um, appreciable rate for an advanced lifter, they're going to very quickly, you know, reach the point where they can no longer recover um, and likely hurt themselves. Conversely, adding sets to beginners isn't going to be as, you know, detrimental um, because they can't hurt themselves yet. They're using lower absolute loads. And in fact, I would say that adding sets, uh, even 
um, you know, without using necessarily, obviously you're always going to take recovery and performance into account, but we have different training objectives with the beginner. With the beginner, we have a number of other considerations such as technical mastery. So they need to learn uh, how to become proficient at the lift and they need to develop self-confidence and all these sorts of things, right? So adding sets can often have positive benefits for beginners because it allows them to learn movements that have a larger uh, learning curve at an accelerated rate, such as the squat, giving them more time to practice and get exposure to that movement. And that can fast track a lot of the neural adaptations and also develop their self-efficacy. So the confidence uh, in their own abilities in that lift. So when we talk about training status and adding sets, I think adding sets for beginners, if time allows, it's totally fine. It's going to mean that they get more practice and, hey, they'll build a bit more work capacity because they're not training as close to failure. They're not disrupting, uh, you know, their system as much as what an advanced lifter is. And they're just going to get more confidence. Um, so I think it's totally fine with uh, beginner lifters. Uh, intermediates, again, I think it becomes a little bit more nuanced and you can't just add sets week to week to week or uh, in the same fashion that you could with a beginner because intermediates are now starting to lift with greater absolute loads. They're learning, you know, how to develop mind-muscle connection and how to inflict a little bit of pain and discomfort during their sets because they understand that's what it takes to, you know, continually make gains. Uh, so you have to be a little bit more cautious and you can still be proactive and have like a predetermined set progression, I think, uh, with intermediate lifters, uh, especially if they have very stable uh, neurobiological backdrops, meaning that their um, you know, biology and neurology is like relatively stable, so they're not seeing huge fluctuations in, say, stress levels, sleep, energy intake, and things like this. I think uh, you know, with intermediate lifters, you can still have you know, a little bit of a proactive set progression in the early weeks of a mesocycle, um, you know, adding from, say, intro weeks, week one, two, you just see that set climb up if the goal is hypertrophy, of course, and then you, know, you just assess from there and see whether recovery um, you know, demands allow for, for more sets or not. Uh, but with advanced lifters, because you do have a lot of historical data on an advanced lifter and they know how to hurt themselves, you want to set things up, in my opinion, uh, at the maximum adaptive range, because remember, the, the stimulus is always a range, right, in terms of both the, the dose and the, the magnitude of the stimulus, right? It's always a range. Like, even if you perform one week um, an RP8 for three sets, and let's say that that gets you, uh, you know, a certain magnitude uh, and dosing of stimulus, if the following week you perform, um, you know, three sets of eight, at an RP7, so the you know proximity of failure is down, you're still getting some growth stimulus. It's just not as much. And even if you perform two sets of eight at an RP8 in that second week, so you've lost a set, you're still getting some. And yes, this is not always, um, you, this shouldn't give people the license to just, um, you know, chop and change their program and, you know, do less based on how they feel and all these kind of things. Um, but it should give people the confidence that hypertrophy is just about, you know, getting that stimulus repeatedly over time and it's a range. And provided you're ticking the boxes most of the time and you're within that range um, of that overload threshold, you're going to get some stimulus for growth and you're going to get some growth from that. Whether you get, you know, this much, you get 10 units of growth or eight units of growth or six units of growth. And that's just arbitrary, um, you know, way to represent growth from a training session. Um in the grand scheme of things, really isn't going to matter. But if over time you can yes start to figure out how you can get uh, more units of growth per workout, you know, within your recovery demands, uh, you know, that's the goal. And when we have uh, advanced lifters, we generally know um, with a lot more sort of certainty where uh, that stimulus is going to be to get the you know the most units of growth. So I think we want to start the mesocycle there and just try to keep them within that range. Um, you know, as, mu as much as we can uh, without them getting hurt. Um, and if you do that over time, yeah, they'll generally grow. I, I think that last part is, is critically important to remind the listeners of because while in recent years there has become a, a greater fascination with the logbook and that is an absolutely fantastic thing, as you mentioned, o overload is a range, especially when we're talking about muscle hypertrophy and what's going on with this adaptation. And what we're really interested in is tension at the fiber level and kind of load on the bar and everything else. These are just kind of proxies for uh, a sufficient stimulus. So with this fascination 
of the logbook, it, it seems I, I've seen many people say, you know, well, this this session was bad because I lost two reps from last week or, you know, something has to immediately change within the program because of one bad session. But but as you kind of alluded to, just because reps might be down by one or two or loads off by five pounds in, the, in this one session from the week prior, that doesn't mean you didn't achieve a sufficient stimulus for further adaptations. Is that correct? Totally. Based on uh, my understanding of uh, exercise science and uh, muscle physiology, I would say that, yeah, for hypertrophy, you're just looking at getting a stimulus over time. You're looking at getting that mechanical tension over time. And as the muscle grows, you should start performing better as you get better. And that's your proxy for whether or not you're building muscle uh, in conjunction with scale weight increases as well as, you know, your visuals and your girth measurements. So are the muscle groups growing? Are you looking bigger? Are you filling out your T-shirts and jeans? And are you weighing more? If um, And this is called triangulation. So this is what they do in the research is that they bear, um, well, they take multiple different measurement techniques and they bear them about the outcome that you're looking to assess. Uh, and when you have all of those uh, you know, different measurements um, pointing in the direction of, uh, you know, growth, then, yeah, you know, things are working. And whether or not the logbook you know, was consistently going up week to week to week, I think is, um, you know, not necessarily the necessary, it's not necessary, sorry, um, for you to, to make gains, um, especially as you become an intermediate and you get more advanced, um, you're going to see less and less weeks of making gains. You know, I have some of my advanced guys and I'm talking, you know, these are, um, you know, high level physique athletes and, and powerlifters. Um, and just because I train high level powerlifters doesn't mean that they just do powerlifting training. Uh, you know, they still need to get bigger if they want to get stronger. Um, you, you know, they're looking to, to see some performance improvements. Oh man, maybe, you know, three, four times a year, you know, uh, it's, it's very slow going, you know, at that, at that level. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean they're not growing though. It just means they're able to um, express those gains and see the fruits of their labor, basically, um, less often, right? And as a beginner, we get to, you know, we get rapid rates of growth. Therefore, we get rapid rates of progression. As we reach our genetic potential, things slow down and therefore, um, you know, our ability to see improvements in repetition strength, it takes a little bit longer to manifest. Uh, it's a little bit slower and you know, because of the nature of the beast, we have to manage fatigue. And that's going to mean that we, you know, are only going to see, um, you know, peak performance, you know, in the context of hypertrophy, meaning, you know, training with volumes that you're performing for, um, you know, loads and reps that are near your best uh, at very, you know, small um, periods during a mesocycle. And that might be, you know, a week or two before a deload. So, you, you know, if you're training cycles at around six weeks, um, you might have only one or two weeks each mesocycle where you're going to see whether or not you've added, you know, some reps and load. Fantastic. You mentioned there that it might be a good idea generally for, for beginners to add sets compared to the advanced lifter. And I think this brings up a point that is fascinating, at least to me, and that's, you know, we, we've become extremely interested in, in this RP model of training, progressing sets from, from MEV to MRV over the mesocycle. And, and the reason for this, I believe, is that because this could be the optimal way to design hypertrophy training. This also suggests that if you're focused on the optimal program design for hypertrophy, you're probably a pretty high level athlete looking to you know get those couple of extra percentage points to to make some further progress but from what i've heard from dr mike it, it sounds like the advanced athlete their mev and mrv are more or less the same and, and f this might not be a question but i am curious about your thoughts on this because i i do think it is really interesting that you know we're, we're fascinated with this model to optimize hypertrophy training yet for those who really need to optimize their training they probably really shouldn't be touching their sets at all i have nothing further to add to that i think you summarized it perfectly which is why as i said for advanced lifters uh we have historical data that we know 
the amount of sets that is going to produce some gains and we set it there and we auto regulate based on whether or not they're recovering and seeing performance improvements uh, in the time courses that we would expect. So yeah, in, in this <laughs> giant debate on the topic, you know, between yourself, Brian Meyer and Eric Helms, and then the guys at RP, I, the, there's probably more common ground than, than most people would like to believe. Um, all right, since, since we got that out of the way, if, if we look at some, some other considerations for when it might be uh, a bad idea to add sets or a good idea, what what comes to mind in terms of nutrition status? So if, if we have an athlete who who's either in a surplus or dieting, do, does it make more sense to add sets in one of these phases? Could it even make sense to to decrease sets, perhaps in the case of dieting? Yeah, great question, Mike. I think um, if you are consuming a diet that uh, is very very energy rich and you're in a, in a hypercaloric state so you're in a cal caloric surplus um, your recovery is going to be enhanced and you're going to simply have more nutrients available to speed up repair and recovery processes so um, you're going to be able to do more work in general right um, and you're also going to have um, a physiological state um, where most things are you know humming along pretty well assuming that your body fat isn't super high, you're not getting weight at an extremely fast rate, all those sorts of things. So I think um, when you're in a surplus, you can definitely do a little bit more. Um, does that mean that you should do more? No. As I mentioned earlier, it's an on an as-needs basis. Um, your diet will just facilitate more gains from whatever work that you're doing. Um, and then when those sets or the amount of work that you're currently performing is no longer producing the gains, um, then you increase, um, you know, the sets. Now, when it comes to dieting, well, as I hope most of your listeners know, when we're dieting, when we're trying to lose fat, we should train in a way uh, that is very, very similar to how we built the muscle. Just because you're dieting doesn't mean you should change your training plan or reduce set volume. Again, it's on an as-needs basis. When recovery and performance start to take a hit because you're dieting, you have diet fatigue, um, you're, you're a smaller person, you just have less energy available to go towards recovery and repair, uh, then you would reduce sets. Um, but I would never reduce or increase sets just because I'm in a certain dieting phase. I think whatever dieting phase you're in will allow you to recover better or worse and that will then determine whether or not you need to decrease or increase sets not the other way around i think i think that's a, a nice reminder for the listeners because while i do agree most people would be on the same page that hey don't you don't need to immediately touch your training just because you transitioned into a deficit i i have heard some people get confused over this topic because it's well if if i'm in an energy deficit and i'm uh in this catabolic state i i can offset that by increasing my volume and, and volume is an anabolic stimulus so so that could be a good idea or people will think well i i'm taking out calories which means i should immediately start performing less work and, and as as you touched on in this main idea of our discussion, you, you probably should just, it's on an as needed basis. And that's when we should be mm -hmm. touching our volume. It's not very sexy. It's not very um, appealing, but it works. Uh, yeah. I think if you're trying to increase sets to achieve more of an anabolic stimulus whilst dieting, because you're now more catabolic, it's like trying to fight fire with fire. You get burnt. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I love the analogy. Perfect. <laughs> perhaps to spin this discussion on a slightly brighter note and, and perhaps find some positivity in manipulating set volume from week to week. The, this main, another main idea be, behind this program design, besides theoretically being optimal for hypertrophy, is that if you don't increase sets throughout the mesocycle, you don't really know whether or not you could be under training or you could recover from more volume. And if you can, then that probably means you're going to get better gains. So it's a good idea to increase set volume to find where that MRV is. 
do you think it could be a good idea for most individuals to at least at some point within their long-term planning to run one of these blocks of training just to see if they can truly recover from more volume or if they've been underdosing their training for, for a long period? Well, I think uh, earlier I just uh, outlined the, the JPS model where we add sets for beginners so they get more practice and exposure and they can't hurt themselves. And then intermediates uh, adding sets over the first few weeks of a mesocycle. And then we stop adding sets when we see that recovery is becoming an issue and they start reporting that, hey, uh, I'm feeling really sore and we might see performance in subsequent workouts starts to suffer a little bit. Um, and then when we're advanced, we know based on moving through that where somebody should be allocating their volume. Uh, so I think that model that I just outlined then, the JPS model, is uh, the exact same as the RP model, except it just does it over a longer time course. So I think, yes, it can be beneficial to run from low volumes to high volumes, um, you know, in a mesocycle. Um, but I think, uh, as I said, you know, if you're doing that as a beginner and intermediate, um, you're just reaching that MRV at a different time point, um, and it's got a different uh, objective. Like you're not trying to find your volume landmarks per se. Um, you're trying to instead you're trying to find the volume that allows you to uh, get the most stimulus and still recover. And I think that you don't necessarily need to ramp in a, in a really assertive manner uh, over a very short time course uh, in order to do that. So basically, uh, when we consider the training history uh, of a late, intermediate, or advanced lifter, when they're coming to you, you're looking over, over their log, we basically should already have a good idea of, of around where their MRV is, and they don't need to run a specific block to determine it. Correct. Correct. Great. I Yeah, because I, I do think, you know, they're... I don't know, maybe maybe there is a slight bit of fear mongering when, when we consider this model, you know, like, have you been underdosing your training this entire time? Like, and because when we consider volume, and if we agree that it plays a predominant role in, in muscle hypertrophy, then we want to make sure we're getting enough of it. And then if we also consider how we're tracking our progress primarily, it, for muscle growth, it, it's usually we're using performance as a proxy. And as we know, the more volume we do, you know, we might see better hypertrophy, but we're also generating more fatigue in the process, which can mask fitness, make it harder to detect uh, if we're getting better with our training. It can lead to to quicker performance plateaus. So it, it, this thing can kind of muddy the water and, and people aren't sure if they're obtaining a sufficient stimulus for hypertrophy, right? Because we could always significantly decrease volume and we would see great performance gains by doing so, but volume might be so low that we're not actually achieving hypertrophic adaptations. Um, so I guess, I guess the question becomes, how, how much better should we be getting from mesocycle to mesocycle, if that makes sense? Because, you know, we could always keep volume low and performance would skyrocket. And we could always jack volume up, but then our performance probably won't increase much from week to week. So I, I think people can, can get confused over, you know, how much should I be progressing? What, what is enough volume? What, what metrics should we be looking at? Yeah, so for beginners, I think we should see performance improvement. So adding load or reps, basically workout to workout, week to week. Intermediates, I think you should be able to add uh, a rep or some load, uh, some increment in load, um, at least every you know two to three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And as an advanced athlete, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to happen a couple of times a year. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna see you know breaking through some performance, um, some some plateaus in your performance. Uh, so I think if you use those uh, rules of thumb, uh, you can then see you know over a mesocycle, okay, beginners should progress throughout the whole mesocycle. Intermediates should progress and see performance improvements every couple of weeks. So comparing, say, week two in mesocycle number two to week two of mesocycle one, have they improved? Week three should see an improvement, or week four should see an improvement based on the previous minute. So, whereas advanced lifters, you're looking at cool, uh, you know, your rep strength in the three to five, uh, sorry, in the five to eight rep range on the squat, um, 
you know, six months ago, have we seen any improvement? Excellent. And I Should... think that's that's pretty, yeah, pretty easy way to sort of determine whether or not you're doing enough. Um, and as I said, uh, you'll know if you're doing too much because you'll start to see your performance plateau, um, you know, in the early weeks of a mesocycle and you won't progress at that rate, right? So if you're doing too much or too little, right, you'll see your performance in as an intermediate week two compared to week two of the previous measure cycle, it might be down. And same for, you know, week three and four, week three and week four. If you're not doing it enough, right, your performance will plateau, you'll start to regress and you'll see, you know, your average repetition strength uh, in that second measure cycle will be down on the previous measure cycle. If you're doing too much, you won't be recovering and the same thing will happen. Excellent. I, I think that is super important for, for people to keep in mind on, on whether or not. So, you know, if we consider performance and, and it might be a good idea to increase or decrease set volume to increase acute performance, but then also, you know, consider, consider your training status. If you, if you are quote unquote advanced and, and maybe that's an objective categorization of advanced and, and your performance is skyrocketing from week to week, maybe you are underdosing your training volume a little bit. Cause as you outlined, if you really are advanced, you shouldn't be making that much progress. So you could probably benefit from a little bit more training volume. Yep. Totally. I, would, I agree with that. So, Jacob, to wrap things up, we, we've outlined a number of points here, and I think there's definitely some gold in here for the listeners and, and some practical takeaways. When, when we look at the, the perhaps main critique of, of increasing sets from week to week, what, what do you think is the main drawback of, of this approach? If you're doing that proactively in a predetermined fashion as per the original a letter to the editor. So moving from 10 to 20 sets a week, I think the main critique is if you do that for every body part or muscle group, and you have say seven body parts of your training and you move from 10 to 20 sets, that's an extra 70 sets a week. I think nobody in their right mind has the time to allocate to training for that kind of increase. And I think that um, it is just adding more noise to the program and that makes it very hard whether or not uh, you know performance is improving at, on the time scale uh, that it should be based on the lifter's level of advancement. I think that sums things up extremely well. Jacob, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your time and your insight, my man. For listeners who want to go and support you, where should they go? Uh, you can go to uh, JPS, uh, Health and Fitness, A-N-D, uh, dot com dot au. That's our website. We have a YouTube channel, JPS Health and Fitness, and we also have uh, Instagram. And we put out some informative content at JPS underscore education. And our client and uh, community page is JPS Health underscore Fitness. And if you want to follow me for some bad dad jokes, um, <laughs> education here and there uh jacob uh, skepis s-c-h-e-p-i-s underscore j-p-s and all of those links will be in the show notes but that does it for another episode of the muscle memoirs podcast thank you so much for listening everyone thank you hey guys mike here if you're interested in learning more about how to maximize your health body composition and performance head over to hammerawayfitness.com where you can sign up for coaching or even just schedule an hour consult with me to get some of your training and nutrition questions answered. Also, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did and would like to further support the growth of the Muscle Memoirs podcast, you can give a donation to the link in the show notes, leave us a review, and or share this episode with your friends whether that be dropping the link in a group chat or putting a screenshot in your Instagram story, I truly appreciate it.